You're at the high nibble for the more significant bits. It's been almost a year to the week since I last released new firmware for the IMSA 8080 ESP. And I guess there are two reasons for that. No, one, life's been busy. And the second one is, in that time, I've been working on the firmware for the Kremenko Z1, which, at the time of the release of this video, is in public beta. And you can download it from the um, High Nibble GitHub website. Uh, but hand in hand with that comes uh, it, an, a firmware for the IMSA 8080 that is also in beta, because the two machines now share a common a code base for the desktop user interface. And so through this video, uh, I want to demonstrate to you some of the new features of the desktop interface, user interface in the context of the IMSA 8080 ESP. So right now, uh, what you're looking at shouldn't look any different apart from the inclusion of one new desktop icon, the tape. Uh, we'll have a look at what that is in just a minute, but we'll start by opening the sys window and the first thing you might notice is that uh, we're running web front end 1.12 and that's two versions along from what you would uh, currently have on an IMSA 8080 ESP which is 1.10. Uh, 1.11 was the Kremamco Z1 only version and 1.12 is the um, consolidated or shared code base for the two machines. So the good thing is that anything I add to one machine uh, should be available for the other machine if it's relevant. You'll notice here that this is uh, the new firmware 1.110 but beta 2. Um, maybe by the time you're watching this video it may have already gone production. The only other few changes worth noting here are the under memory map You'll see that uh, the machine by default is just set up with 64K of RAM, in bank zero that is, and it has uh, its additional seven banks of 48K. Um, this is a sort of a standard default memory map for each machine now, just 64K of RAM and no ROMs by default, and just whatever banked um, RAM that they have. And uh, I'll demonstrate a little later how um, memory maps are now managed because it is a little different to previous versions of the firmware. Scrolling on down, the only other things noted, worth noting are that um, the organization of this information has been centered around putting the guest, um, op uh, guest environment details first, uh, with the host systems details coming second, and then finally the background processes that are making everything happen and at the moment that shouldn't look any different uh, but we'll revisit this again in just a moment. Not much is going to change until we start the machine so if I open the CPA you will see when I press the power button on the physical uh, front panel uh, we start in a wait state and there is a little, um, not so much a bug, but something I might work to improve is to get the desktop to update at that point. Um, because if I refresh the sys window, you'll see now we have a memory map uh, that includes the uh, boot ROM. And also in this case, I've loaded the ROM for the VIO because I want to include that in the demonstration. We see details about power on jump addresses and banked RAM and ROM. And if we scroll right down to those processes again, there is a new process here called C for the CPA. Uh, previously in the firmware, updates to the LEDs and polling of the switches were sort of done in the CPU process uh, and effectively stole cycles from the CPU. Uh, that's been moved to a separate execution core and a separate process. And so now the CPU is free to run as fast as it possibly can especially when we set the uh, processing speed to unlimited. Unfortunately, the disks don't refresh automatically, and that's the thing I need to look at improving. But if I refresh the desktop and open the sys window again, you can see the mounted disks. The desktop icons have also updated to reflect the disks that are mounted, and uh, we can get on with the rest of the demonstration. So we'll start with the... Oh, before I do that, I'm sorry, uh, a couple of other noticeable changes are small rounded corners on the windows, uh, really just something to cue that we're on a new version of the desktop UI, but also many of the windows have now been made resizable. So we can resize the sys window um, and just see more of the information at once. 
and I'll uh, progressively demonstrate each of the windows that can be resized. So let's start with the VIO or CRT window. Uh, we'll put the machine into a run state, connect the VIO and we're in CPM. So let's get something on the screen to look at and we'll find that the VIO is resizable. And in fact, it scales um, to the window size. There's obviously some pixel averaging that makes it look a little unreadable at certain sizes. And I have realized that there's no ability to easily get back to exactly 100%. You can kind of pick it when things look right. Um, but I might add a new icon up here, new glyph up here, that'll just take you straight back to 100%. That'd probably be pretty convenient. We can still go full screen uh, and the keyboard commands for getting out of full screen have been standardized now on command enter uh, for Mac platforms and control enter for Windows platforms. All right, so that's the uh, VIO or CRT window that's resizable. Let's now have a look at the Dazzler. So if we go and run the classic kaleidoscope, whoop, spell it properly. Um, get the kaleidoscope running, we can see that the Dazzler window is also rescalable or resizable and the content scales according to the size of the window. Pretty simple demonstration there. Uh, now let's hand over the console to the CRT, sorry, to the teletype, uh, the VT100 window and see how that resizes. So we'll get back to the A drive and use the stat command to reassign the console to the teletype. Get something to look at. And um, the sizing mechanism, resizing mechanism is different on the teletype because it's font based. We can't just have it infinitely scalable. So there's no widget in the corner to resize the window. But like a lot of terminal emulators that I've used over the years, we can on Mac platforms use command plus and minus and the window will resize in single font steps on windows that would be control plus and minus you'll notice there is a glitch or a bug here that uh, the content seems to have disappeared as soon as we make the window scroll uh, the content reappears it's just a bug i'm using an older version of xterm.js uh, i'll look at getting that fixed soon but you can work around it so long as you can scroll the window the content will be redisplayed um, so we can still get to a, a, a full full screen view and again using command enter to get back to the windowed view and that also has the same sort of refresh issue that i'll work to fix in the future okay so um other windows are resizable as well, so if we open the manual, we can. there is a resize widget in the corner and we can change that window size and the icons move around to be displayed in whatever window size you set. Um, the disk library similarly is resizable and the icons shuffle around to fill the window. And that's, uh, that's largely it. So the teletype, CRT, library, uh, disk library, manual library, Dazzler and SysWindow. And just before we get on to having a look at this new tape um, window, uh, I just want to show you one other change with the desktop user interface. Uh, long running actions such as doing a firmware or a desktop uh, UI update um, appear a little differently. So if I do a desktop UI update, dropping the update bin on the system icon, uh, we get the familiar dialog about confirming that we want to um, upload this to the flash memory. But when we say OK, we now get a, a sort of shutter, a dark shutter over the screen and this spinning timer um, or spinner, sh I should say, uh, while the uploads taking place. Okay, so um, let's look at the last feature, which is the tape window. So the tape window gives us the facility to maintain a library of paper tapes 
locally on the machine instead of having to only be able to um, download or dra or upload files from our host operating system we can now maintain a library of tapes on locally on the machine so we can take a file and drag it into the paper tape punch and it's loaded up we can also take files and delete them we can download them and uh, we can refresh the view that doesn't often have need to happen uh, we can take a paper tape that's been punched imagine we've just punched this from some application we're running we can take a paper tape that we've punched and add it to the library with a drag and drop uh, it will always come in as a file called punch.tape uh, we really need the facility to be able to rename that file at the moment you'd have to download it to the host rename it there and upload it again which is a little inconvenient um, and we can also, as we've always been able to do, take a file from our a host file explorer. I've grabbed something called ping.list here, which is just a basic uh, program listing, and still drop that on the paper tape. That's always been possible. But we can also drag and drop files from the host operating system uh, file explorer onto the tape window, and it will just directly upload and add that file to the tape library. But there is one more icon up here, or glyph, uh, and that is meant to represent an IC or a chip. And this allows us to take a file in the tape library, specifically and only a hex or an .mos file, which are um, ASCII representations of binary files in known file formats, the Intel hex format or the MOS um, file format. And effectively have them loaded as if they've been burnt to a prom when the when the machine is next rebooted so if we grab something like ping.list and drop it on this we'll get a warning saying that only intel hex files and mos tech um, mos file tape formats can be bootloaded great so let's take um, dazzlemation.hex and um, load that up and, and boot the machine directly from that binary as if it's been burnt to a prom now i will warn you that um, you should set the machine to its default memory model for this so that there are no other roms loaded and then there's no rom, ROM banking enabled so i'll just quickly do that now by going into the um, non-volatile storage system configuration and just setting the machine into uh, its default memory model and reboot the machine. Okay, so we're back into in the machine. We've got the default memory model. Um, I think that will persist now, even when I power on the front panel. You can just refresh that. Yep, so we have a, the standard 64K of RAM and no other loaded ROMs. So we'll get back to our tape library, and this time we will drag the dazzlemation.hex tape up, drop it on that new glyph, and it says bootload tape dazzlemation.hex at next power on. If we hit escape, it'll cancel the operation. We have to click bootload to confirm. And now when I power cycle using the power switch on the front panel, which will make us, of course, reload the desktop. So before I power on, let's get our various peripherals open that we want to see. We want the dazzler. We want the paper tape library and paper tape reader we get the dazzler into some open space and now when I power on the machine using the front panel switch and hit run you'll notice we get the cursor on the dazzler corresponding to the fact that dazzlemation is running so that has been loaded as if it was had been burnt to a prom and been used to boot the machine it is only a, a one-time operation. Um, in fact, this is a facility that's always been available in Z80 Pack using a, a command line flag called uh, dash X or minus X, um, but you've, there's never been an interface to enable that on um, 
the MSA 8080 ESP, but now we can. If a hex file is uh, something that you want to have available as a permanent sort of in a permanent configuration as a ROM, then that can be configured in one of the memory models, which we'll have a look at shortly. But this is just a sort of one time sort of tried out operation. Anyway, to prove that it's all working, let's get the Magenta Martini data tape loaded into the tape reader, connect that to the machine and hit read. So that's pretty much it for a tour of the features of the desktop user interface. The last thing I'll just mention again is that uh, the two most significant changes to this version of the firmware are the inclusion of the tape uh, window or library, um, but also the change to the different uh, way of specifying memory models. And this is to do with the current development branch of Z80 Pack. Uh, we've seen some examples of that, the default memory map of just 64K of RAM and no ROMs, um, but these memory models are specified in the system.conf file now, uh, which was previously pretty redundant, but now we have these memory model specifications. Um, so we, this is where we can say how many uh, 256 byte pages of RAM there should be in the machine, what ROMs should be loaded, where the machine should auto boot to. So here we have the default uh, boot ROM for the IMSA. Here we have the boot ROM and the VIO ROM um, for the IMSA. Uh, here we uh, can have a memory model to load into the Memon80 um, ROM or XY Basic ROM. Um, so we can set up different memory models and the bits in the non-volatile storage system configuration word, bits 8 to 10, now index these memory maps rather than uh, indexing the settings that used to be in boot.conf which simply selected a ROM by number now they select a whole memory model by number um, but you know that's a, a more detailed conversation that'll either be documented on the website or maybe be the subject of a follow-up video to this one so thanks for watching and I hope you got something out of it and are looking forward to getting your hands on this version of the firmware for the IMSA 8080.